Get ready to take a flamethrower to the official narrative and learn what the elites don't want you to know. You're listening to The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here, episode 2510 of The Tom Woods Show, and we are here with a dear, dear friend of The Tom Woods Show, and that is Gene Epstein. And as you may recall, if you watched the video of or attended the 2000th episode event of The Tom Woods Show, Gene was unable to attend, but in classic Gene Epstein style, he forwarded along a video greeting to me and the assembled guests. And in that episode, in that video he supplied, he, it turns out, had actually sat down and calculated the exact percentage of Tom Woods show episodes that featured Gene Epstein. Because I mean, now it's medical error, so, so like, I couldn't even but, do anyway, go ahead. But it, it was the thought that counted, yeah. Gene. It was the thought that counted. Well, okay. Gene has uh, credentials uh, you know, that go from here to here. Uh, I, could, I could review them with you all day, but after uh, no longer being with Barron's as the uh, economics and book review editor, he began uh, directing the Soho Forum, which, of course, is everybody's favorite debate series that covers issues of very great importance, records those debates uh, for posterity, and sheds an awful lot of light. So at least, we're very glad to have you back, Gene. Certainly speaking, of course, just to be more precise, uh, um, I uh, uh, just as you had Terrence Keeley on after he left the Cato Institute, Tom, not while he was there, um, uh, I also also have to point out that I started the Soho Forum in... September of 2016 is when I had my first debate. In fact, months before. I was still at Barron's then. I didn't leave Barron's until early uh, uh, 2018. So, in fact, there was a two years when I was doing both at the same time. I well, I just, I just assumed, Gene, no one could do that. Yeah, so. exactly. Um, and then I thought that I would, uh, you know, spend more time. And that fact, I was happily pushed out. You know, I was, I was 72, 73, and I thought... Uh, this job is kind of easy. I can make it hard. I can make it easy. Uh, and uh, it's difficult to quit a job when the job is kind of a sinecure. So happily, the editor-in-chief got pushed out, and I got pushed out as well. Uh, from Barris, after 26 years of doing the same thing, I thought I could do something else, which, which was a very good eventuality. I was sorry for some of the others that got pushed out, but for me, it was a good event. And, uh, and of course, I'm also basically in a great mood because... I was at Pork Fest last week, the Porcupine Festival in New Hampshire. And uh, there's a direct connection with you, Tom, in so many ways, because uh, uh, I can't walk 100 yards at Pork Fest without being greeted by an admirer. And, uh, you know, probably if that happened to me all the time in New York City, I'd get a little annoyed. However, the fact that it happens for a few days at Pork Fest is a very pleasant experience. Smart people, young people, old people, and half the time they know me because I've been on the Tom Woods show about 50 times. Uh, half the time they know me because of you, Tom, uh, That because uh, they enjoy my appearance. The other half, it's because of my solo form and maybe a couple of other minor appearances. But you are ever present in my mind. I'm sorry you couldn't make it to Port Fest. I'm glad to announce uh, your little secret, which is come to light. You told Carla Garrick, in eight years, you'll be living in New Hampshire, right? Well, I have a goal that I can't disclose. But first of all, I'm, people, we are going to talk about some substantive things. <laughs> this is how Gina and I begin every podcast episode. Okay. But I have I have a twofold plan. Yeah. Uh, for what I'm going to do oh. in, in eight years. And part of it involves uh, living in southern New Hampshire. Oh, yes. But the other part, I'm not revealing right now. I'll More reveal because I have my own plan. But I'm going to live somewhere else six months and a year, uh, six months and a day. And then six months minus a day, I'll live in southern New Hampshire. Oh, yeah, I see. Okay. I'm keeping it mysterious for reasons that will become clear eight years from now. Or I'm looking forward to that, Tom. I'll, be, I'll tell you privately, Gene, but not the whole world. Oh, the reason why Tom will tell that to me privately is because I turn 80 this November, and Tom is a little concerned that I'll even be around, I guess, uh, uh, for him uh, once he actually does this. I mean, uh, <laughs> no, it's that you're my friend, and I want you to know it's not that I think you're going to. See, I've got, this pers I've got this persecution complex. And uh, so, uh, sorry, Tom. Yeah. And indeed, Tom is still, I want to tell you, 
Thomas told me a number of things because I'm his friend in confidence that the world will never know that will die with me. Um, and if he ever wants to reveal those. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a good confidant of Tom's. And Tom knows that. And I'd be fascinated to know Tom. Uh, but, 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 but could you imagine? Why don't you? Could you, could you imagine yeah. what a fantastic ebook for like my super duper top supporters at supportinglisteners.com yeah. it would be to have a book call by Gene Epstein called Secrets of Tom Woods. I mean, I, that, tell you, that would sell itself, Gene. <laughs> and I, but I can't publish that because I've got too much integrity. Uh, so oh, you do. I was up at Pork Fest and um, I, um, I had two debates and uh, um, I, I didn't, I actually promoted these debates. I didn't want to bring in outside debaters. Actually, it wasn't even so much the money. Just a little hassle, a bit of a hassle, because my my COO, my, my chief operating officer, can't make it up there. So I would have had to handle all the logistics of bringing them up there. So I knew that Dennis Pratt, uh, who is, of course, the the free state philosopher, a great guy, who in prior years has run Porkfest, and a dear friend by the, is Dennis, uh, uh, I knew that he'd be there, and I concocted something for us to debate. And I knew, and I think it's terrific, that David Friedman goes there every year. He no longer goes to Freedom Fest, by the way, but he does schlep out to Pork Fest every year, and he delivers uh, a lot of very smart lectures. We debated last year, David and I did, about his view of the non-aggression principle, and I was told by Olga Sorens, who runs it, that we were sort of the hit of the of the of the of the week. Uh, that, it, that we had a very interesting exchange. You know, two guys, two guys in their late seventies, two Jewish economists, colliding on a certain particular idea. Uh, and so I said, we got to do it again. So I concocted something else to, to debate with David. And so those were the two debates I did. But then um, that was Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, I have a condition called dystonia. Rhymes with Estonia. It's a movement disorder. Uh, it gives me some trouble. I had scheduled a Saturday morning presentation on the use of, and abuse of data, but I was just, I just longed to get back to my massage chair in New York City. So I told Olga, I just can't stick around with my Saturday morning classroom, less of a deal. So I, I, I went home with my wife and my assistant on the Friday. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and, but per usual, when I do a debate, or when I do an interview with Tom Woods, uh, the endorphins flow, the hormones come out, the adrenaline flows, and I feel physically better. The dystonia that bothers me bothers me less uh, as when, for example, I, uh, I, I do an interview with you, Tom, or when I do a, a public debate. So it is therapeutic uh, to appear with you. On the other hand, too much of the time, and even now, the dystonia does bother me. And uh, I've gone the whole nine yards with treatment. I've, I've had mega doses of Botox in these jumping muscles. I should say, dystonia is a movement disorder. The muscles jump back and forth. RFK Jr. has dystonia of the vocal cords. The muscles in his larynx keep jumping. Uh, and, uh, and that's why his voice sounds very sandpaperish. I've got a more typical example of dystonia, which is all of the muscles uh, in the back of my neck keep vibrating in a way that continually distracts me. Uh, and uh, I am therefore going to undergo what is called deep brain stimulation, and that's a form of brain surgery. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that helping me. But uh, as it is, I've slowed down a bit because of my condition. And, and I'm sorry for those uh, so formed for those, rather, those people at Porcupine Festival, they will look, they, I had a few, you know, fans in the audience, which especially after the Pratt uh, interview, who were hoping I would stick around. And uh, I I just pled, I said, I, I just got home, get on the massage chair and relax a little bit, which is what I did. But otherwise, I had a great time, and I'm sorry you couldn't make it, Tom. And I'm sorry there were not a whole lot of celebrities at Porcupine Festival this year. And I think that's part of the reason why they had a below average turnout. But otherwise, it was still a great time for me, and I owe it in part to you that I had such a delightful time being there. So that's my story. Yeah. Well, I'm very glad that you're getting the recognition you deserve. And it is nice to walk around and have people acknowledge and recognize the work you've done. And, and I'm, I'm glad if I had a hand in 
in in garnering that recognition, then I'm then that's something I'm very proud of. So let's talk about okay. these debates that you had, because as people know, yeah. we do a lot of after the fact uh, second guessing of ourselves. Yes, indeed. You, you can tell me how I screwed up, Tom, because again, I want I want you to sock it to me, Tom. You know, I don't I don't want any pussy funny. Uh, you've told me occasionally that you have to treat certain guests with kid gloves. Not in my case, Tom. No, 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 that's true. But the, now you're going to make me feel bad because I don't really have criticisms. Whoa. I just have comments. <laughs> right. I have comments, okay? okay. Well, I come. well, let's start with, uh, I don't know if you have them in front of you, the, yeah, well, the I, resolution. I, I know, Tom, 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 I know, look, if, I, if, I, if I'm on the tongue, which I better come prepared because my friend Tom has got, you know, five daughters, too many distractions in his life, and isn't always prepared. So, you know. I understand. I forgive you for so. Yeah, I debated. You wanted to start with the Dennis Pratt debate, um, and that one. That's what I sort of enjoyed more than anything because I got yeah. So, so what was the resolution yeah, in the Dennis yeah. Pratt debate, and which to, yeah. side were you taking? Well, okay, yeah, it's it's a wordy resolution, uh, but I'll read it. I'll read the resolution and then explain uh, uh, a better way. This is the resolution: a better way to persuade more people of libertarianism is to convince them of the ethics stemming from self-ownership and the non-aggression principle without relying primarily on consequentialist utilitarian arguments. In other words, uh, the better way to persuade more people would be to insist on the principle of the non-aggression principle of self-ownership. Uh, you don't need that consequentialism, but you can persuade more people by hitting them with both barrels rather than uh, going strictly for the consequentialism. And, uh, and of course, when we speak of consequentialism, we mean everything other than the non-aggression principle. We mean, as I uh, frequently mean, uh, the conquest of poverty, for example, uh, lifting the living standards of the broadness of people. So uh, the, the distinction was that uh, Dennis, uh, who, who has written like a couple of thousand essays, on the non-aggression principle and on self-ownership, believes that you can't leave home without it. That this is the this is the way to persuade more people. And I uh, honestly felt uh, and did argue. Dennis is now saying we were arguing about not a whole lot. I think Dennis got a little bit miffed because because he lost a uh, little some voting in, in the Oxford style voting, which I'll get to. We always do Oxford style voting, and and sometimes it gets to people a little bit. Uh, uh, Oxford style voting being the before and after vote that they do at Oxford University, uh, and uh, and so when somebody loses in the vote, they feel bad. So I think Dennis felt bad about that. Uh, but uh, I was only trying to point out that uh, we really don't know how to win people to our cause, uh, and uh, that was my position. Uh, maybe you have a couple of comments just in general about what the dichotomy was. I. I uh, I, well, I just want to clarify it for people. Sure, so yeah. what you mean is yeah. we can either argue libertarianism on the grounds that there are certain moral principles you just have to abide by. And, 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 one, and it doesn't mean you don't mention some consequences. Either. No, 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 no. That's right. We're right. But but that the leading argument yeah, would yeah. be, yeah. Uh, you know, that self-ownership is non-negotiable and certain things follow from that. Yes. The other way of arguing would be if you implement our ideas, you get great results. You know, if you, if you lower taxes, you get uh, more robust economic activity, uh, you know, this, that, and the other thing. If you have f fewer restrictions on speech, you get more robust or, change of ideas, or, whatever. Or as I said, as I said in the debate, uh, not infrequently, when some of those upper, upper West Side progressives asked me why I'm a libertarian, I, I perhaps somewhat perversely answer because I come from a left-wing background and I care about poor people climbing out of poverty. That's why I'm a libertarian. You know, so I give them this surprising answer, which of course is a strictly consequentialist response. So indeed, that's right. the one example I used, yeah. Hey folks, quick message from virtual storefronts. If you own a local business and you know you should probably be online, but you have no idea where to start and you're sure you can't afford it, then virtual storefronts is for you. They help local businesses get online faster and quicker than ever before. 
and they focus on getting local results in the search engines. You just set it and forget it. You set up keywords that match items you sell, and the virtual storefront's back end handles the rest. No maintenance or upkeep required. So you name it. Restaurants, boutiques, salons, farmers markets, food trucks, art galleries, gift shops, event services, lawyers, insurance agents, cleaning, landscaping, whatever you can dream up. Any locally owned, non-major franchise that is 12 or fewer locations, business, that maintains regular hours and serves the public in a local area is qualified to create, maintain, and communicate with the public with a storefront at virtualstorefronts.com. Absolutely fantastic. Check it out. Get all the details at virtualstorefronts.co. That's virtualstorefronts.co. Okay, so so that's the distinction. Yeah. And, and as I say, and as you say, I think most people probably use some kind of a combination of both. And, and some types well, of arguments reach people better than other types of arguments. Yeah. And so. Well, well um, yeah. I mean, again, uh, this is the irony. Uh, Carol Dennis, who's also a dear friend, that's uh, Dennis Pratt's uh, wife. Uh, when, uh, we, when I greeted them, Carol said, last year you debated David Friedman, uh, who believes that the non-aggression principle is incoherent. And uh, you, uh, the, uh, technically won that debate. Uh, I argued no. That, uh, David has not proved that the non-aggression principle is incoherent. It is a coherent principle. So she said, uh, "Now where are you coming from?" So I. So in fact, when I when I introduced my argument, I mentioned Carol uh, uh, on uh, uh, when I when I went for the negative responding to Dennis, and I said, "No, I still." agree that the superior way uh, is to emphasize uh, freedom, emphasize uh, the zero, zero aggression principle. You had Gerard Casey on it, and I've been a fan of his idea of calling it the zero aggression principle, even though that hasn't caught on. So I said, no, I still feel that way. But uh, I, I, I believe that there are a whole lot of people out there who are just, who I encounter all the time, who are just basically... Uh, think that our emphasis on freedom is vacuous. You know, at one point, I, here's a good case. At one point, I was asked by somebody uh, when the Q&A started, why can't we just say, you know, don't don't hurt people don't, and don't take their stuff? Why can't that convince people? Why is that enough? And I answered and said, well, I'll take you to the Upper West Side and we'll we'll put a mic under everybody's, you know, the passers-by faces. And we'll ask them, is that enough for you? And you know what they're going to say? They'll say, huh, what are you guys out to lunch, you crazy libertarians? Don't you realize that under capitalism, the, the, the economic system that you think is essential to your libertarian vision, under capitalism, people get exploited financially and they have to report to a growling dictatorial boss, and you're talking freedom, that's what they're going to say to you. And uh, and so, therefore, uh, you don't have time to tell them about don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. Uh, what The only thing you have time for is to try to explain to them uh, what the nature of capitalism really is. And so that's the reason why I wanted to emphasize that there was a whole world out there of people can be reached strictly on the basis of consequentialism. I know you sense like you're gonna bounce about. Well, no, I'm thinking this over because yeah. the, the the other, if I may, actually agree with you here a bit. Oh. The other problem yeah. that you run into in talking to, let's say, left wingers who really like hard leftists who have really thought this through, yeah. is when you say don't take their stuff. They will argue that it's not really your oh, stuff. Yeah, yeah. That the state has a prior claim on. It. Yeah, yeah. So you shouldn't be keeping it in the first place. Yeah. So then you wind up spending your whole time arguing about what constitutes my stuff and not my stuff. And then you never really get into the heart of anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, indeed. Well, uh, um, okay, now you should. Now, actually, you, you remind me of, uh, <laughs> such, you remind me of, of this debate I keep mentioning it as my most embarrassing. Uh, where, uh, which I had with uh, the socialist Basco Sankara, and uh, I, uh, I lost my temper with him, even though uh, some people thought that was, that was fun. 
I, I, most people thought it was a mistake. But anyway, a Baskar had written an essay, which I quoted, uh, about, uh, will I take your, uh, your something like your, uh, it wasn't your Elvis Presley records. He said, no, you, you can keep your Elvis Presley records. So, uh, so we, we socialists are not trying to take your personal possessions, but, but we believe that the means of production should be owned by the workers. And of course, that's where I pounce and try to explain, as I did with Baskar, as I did with the two other socialists I debated, happily, as I bragged to you, the one with Rick Wolf, where I kept my cool, has gotten 6.6 .6 million YouTube views. I try to explain to them that capitalism is just private ownership of the means of production. It, it doesn't ex exclude the possibility that the workers could be the ones who privately own the means of production. Indeed, uh, all of the all of the socialists I've debated keep talking about this large corporation, large manufacturing corporation in Spain called Mondragon, which was started in the 1960s, which is still going. And then it's simple enough for, my, for me to point out to them that Spain is basically a capitalist country. This worker-owned company was started in a capitalist country much poorer than ours, much poorer than America's uh, uh, economy, and we don't. We have yet to see a Landragon in this country. The the idea that they cannot, given the power of the consumer uh, that the workers have at as consumers, the, the fact that uh, the lower what is the lower uh, ninety percent accounts for eighty percent of all cons consumer spending, given the fact the lower ninety percent has trillions of dollars in assets, take over the means of production. Uh, uh, this, of course, was something that 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 uh, that David Friedman wrote years ago as well. Uh, doesn't preclude that possibility. Why do I mention that? Only because if that's the only kind of property that they care about, then I uh, maybe you're saying I've gotten too complicated with this. I don't think I have. But if my if if you're going to keep bragging about Mondragon in Spain, a capitalist country, then the question becomes: Why don't we have Mondragon in this country? Of course, we can. Uh, the fact is that maybe workers do not want to own, do not want to be the bosses. Maybe they just want to earn a salary. So I, I, you, you put me down this road, Tom. Uh, my point is that when, you, when it comes to the complications of don't take their stuff, it is true that most socialists will say, no, no, I don't want to take your personal possessions. I just want to take you know, the offices and the stores and, and the factories and all the rest. That's the stuff that really matters. Uh, and then I point out that uh, we actually do have worker co-ops anyway, to some small extent. I point out that under capitalism, you can have that easily enough if workers want it. Uh, so that's what I emphasize. Uh, I know where we're at. I'm only trying to point out that I claimed that uh, that people like Baskar, Rick Wolf, uh, and uh, Ben Burgess, the socialists I've debated, are they, you can't preach to them about, about the libertarian issues. You can't really tell them about the zero regression principle. Uh, you can't really tell them that taxation is theft. You know, I encountered Ben Burgess on Dave Smith's show uh, originally when I heard him, and, and they were debating whether taxation was theft or not. It was a non-starter. It was a non-starter. There was no way, they, because you really had to go back to first principles about that. Right. Uh, and so they got nowhere. They basically talked past each other. Uh, and uh, but I hope that I spoke Ben Burgess's language and and uh, and and uh, Rick Wolf's language by pointing out that you can have you you know they, oh we we like markets they, that's the other thing is we respect markets it's just that we don't want those capitalist bosses alienating the workers and of course they they will then say that that capitalism impoverishes which gets into another story so that was my main point with uh, with with Dennis. Pratt, and uh, I thought it was a lively exchange. What comment do you have? All right, so let me let me jump in. So one of the things yeah. that yeah. that uh, Dennis said that I I think is legit. You addressed it, but it's a you know it's a legitimate concern. Oh, is yeah. that I I know. there are a million yeah. policy areas, yes. you know, and so to say, well, look, I'll show you that here's a consequentialist example of how libertarianism yields a better result for everybody. Yeah, look at the way it works, for example, in agriculture. Or then look at the way it works in industrial policy. Yeah. Or look at the way, and the thing is, he's arguing that 
nobody can have a PhD in all these areas. Even the greatest libertarian yeah. can't know everything about everything. So if you get into empirical examples, if you live by empirical examples, you'll die by empirical examples. There'll always be another one that they can throw at you that you don't know about. You know, so yeah. better yeah. stick to the, the foundational principles. Yes. But I think your response to that was along the lines of, fair enough, but if I find that in you know one, two, three, four, five uh, example areas, the same result occurs, that government involvement makes the situation worse, the sixth one is likely to yield the same outcome. The seventh one is likely to see you know, this. I don't need to know 125 examples. Well, that's right. We, we, we aren't even, we, we, we are, I, I would even, I went even further than that because I enjoy uh, quoting Nina Teicholz. I think you did have her once on the show. And then Nina Teicholz, who, who had written a book about uh, nutrition, about the low carb diet. And uh, now she probably was ultra rational, but I enjoyed quoting her because it was a cute point. She said, that all I ever did was do a deep dive and become an expert in obesity, in the history of food. It's a vast subject indeed, it is. Uh, and, and she said, and I discovered that the root cause was government. I, I discovered that uh, the government is just filled with liars and charlatans about the nature of food. Uh, the McGovern Commission, that was George McGovern, who the older crowd might remember, uh, uh, just they just made it all up, and they forced fattening, forced, forced, they persuaded people to eat fattening food, and the government is still part of the problem. And, but then she said that she said uh, then I asked myself, uh, I, I, I get into this one issue, and I find the government is at the root of the problem. She said, what would be the odds that uh, that that government isn't at the root of other problems? In other words, she just thought from this one example, which of course so overwhelmed her. She thought, I just chose this example at random. And I find the government is the root of the problem. So that one example was enough for her. She, she just decided that, and, and indeed, uh, you, know, you, you said six or seven cases. Uh, th there is a way, a point at which the sort of the dam breaks in us. Like, like the two or three issues that we care most about, if we find that government is at the root of the problem, makes it worse. Uh, and probably we don't even need the fourth and fifth and sixth examples. Uh, by the way, uh, you know, one of the, you know, as I like to point out, probably the best consequentialist book on libertarianism ever written is For a New Liberty by Murray Rothbard. Uh, and, uh, you know, because as you as you may recall, you, you know, he goes over in that book uh, almost all of the major issues of the day in the late 1970s when that book came out. And even though, of course, the information is dated, it pretty much addresses most of the major issues. So, indeed, he does that, you know, sort of like six or seven or eight uh, uh, issues discussion, which should be sufficient. And what I thought was also interesting, by the way, about that book is that, you know, that the earlier hardcover edition, he, I, I gather libertarianism was becoming sort of hot in those days a little bit. And so Rothbard, maybe you know more about him than I, he got approached by, by a, some more, uh, more of a mainstream publisher to write a book about libertarianism, a popular book. for, And the earlier version is different from the later version that he wrote. Uh, it, in the later version that he wrote, he begins very strongly to talk about the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, uh, and, uh, uh, and much less of that in the earlier version of Four New Liberty. And why, why do I make that point? Only because uh, for Rothbard, obviously, those are you know libertarian with small l documents, but obviously they're and not that that's not the canonical texts. But Rothbard was really trying opportunistically to convince a large audience by playing the uh, the Constitution and the and the and the, and especially the Declaration of Independence card that that the American Revolution was essentially a libertarian revolution, uh, even though of course he had to c confess it was hardly purely libertarian. And then he goes on to to, to go to a, a number of discuss discussions of different issues of the day, which are pretty much commonly brought up today. Although, uh, as I recall, he didn't really go into what, what, of course, I hear from the socialists, which is that the workers have got to own the means of production. Uh, and uh, that that was the one that, uh, the, the actually, come to think of it, David uh, Friedman, who published uh, almost at the same time, Machinery of Freedom, had a chapter on that uh, in the 70s. Uh, but uh, in any case, 
I would go further than you just to summarize my point and say that that it often is just the two or three issues that you really care about. And once once you begin to see the potential for the first of all for the libertarian world to lift people out of poverty, the potential for the, for, for capitalism to, to be a capitalism where the means of production is owned by workers, that could be sufficient. Uh, that that those are the gut issues, and that could be sufficient for you to have maybe just superficial knowledge of some of the rest of it, the drug laws or whatever else, and uh, and the damn breaks, and uh, and you become a libertarian. Actually, I thought you were going to mention something else. Uh, we are, my answer was not quite sufficient. It uh, it's just that uh, that one of the, one of the kids in the audience challenged me and said, but. But if you believe in capitalism and you believe in smaller government, does that really make you a libertarian? Don't you have to believe in the non-aggression principle to be a libertarian? That was a challenge I was getting. Essentially, aren't you sort of like a libertarian without without mooring? You know, and I guess I, I you know, I at one point I remember saying, uh, you know, Roth, for Rothbard, the challenge was, do you hate the state? I don't know if you recall that. that, that uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, that rough. Do You Hate the State, by the way, was a critique of David Friedman, by the way. Yes. As you may recall. We, we, in a way, I think, I know what you thought of that essay. I, I haven't read it in a long time. I, I, he, he, he would, it, it basically, he was just arguing that David lacked passion, you know, uh, but, I, but, I, but I thought a uh, uh, passion and hatred for the state, and that David was, 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 uh, was of course focusing mainly on the consequentialist issues in that book, and uh, and so I would say, okay, that's a limitation, but it's still, but David still had some valuable insights in that book, and uh, and worth reading. Although, of course, I would still recommend uh, Rothbard, uh, Rothbard's for New Liberty over David. But going back to the point, the, the the challenge that I got was that if I persuade somebody that. Government should be cut by ninety percent. I, I stipulated that uh, that at least will Dennis grant that if you're a minarchist, can you be a libertarian? Because I also said that that when I'm if I present libertarian arguments to anybody so if, with, for whom they're new or new in any way, uh, if I start defending the ANCAP position. And then that just overwhelms the discussion. You probably found that out to be the case, also, right, Tom? In other words, it's much. I mean, you're in your you're occasional encounters with progressives, Tom, here and there. You know, you don't really want to talk and cap with them because, uh, it because again, it, be, it then then it, then their yeah. problems and their doubts about it become just so parallel. Hey, everybody, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, Persist SEO. If you are getting buried by your competition online. Then build your brand, your reputation, and your lead flow with digital marketing by Persist SEO. If you are a small local business trying to compete against large companies in the service industry, then increase your visibility with Persist SEO. What if you have low or no leads coming in on a consistent basis? Well, then website search engine and conversion optimization can help move the needle to a more prosperous business model for you. Are you tired of cold calling and networking, meeting places getting shut down? Use your website as a lead generation engine. Or what if you're not showing up for your services in the search engines? Well, get found with Persist SEO's expert search engine optimization. All you have to do is call 770-580-3736 or visit them at ineedseo.help for a free website audit and consultation. That's 770-580-3736 or I need SEO dot help. Yeah, especially if I'm arguing with somebody on the left, I'm, it wouldn't even occur to me to say, uh, to try to argue, uh, quote, anarcho-capitalism yeah. uh, at that moment, because I don't want to in challenge, challenge their brains so much to the point where I could never get through to them. If they know that the end point I'm getting at is absolute private property, if fully private property society, they're not even going to start listening if I say that's the outcome. Now, it's not that I, I'm not trying to deceive them. Yeah. My point is I don't go for the most difficult part of the argument mm -hmm. because, the, I mean, there are very, very smart people out there who have come all the way up to the verge of anarcho-capitalism and not quite taken the leap. Very, very smart people 
who agree with us, you know, on basically everything. Uh, and even they won't make that leap. So why would I think some random leftoid who doesn't understand anything about anything is going to be prepared to make that leap? My, my argument is simply to do what, what you're suggesting is that I'm going to show that in this area, things are better. This area, things are better. And then you start to, as you say, you, you kind of come to the conclusion, wait a minute, okay, I think I've been sucked into libertarianism. And then at that point, you can start asking yourself the question, well, you know what? I wonder if this general principle works for every good and service. You know, that'd be great if they can have that realization. But, yes. but if, even if they don't ever have that realization, if they can just stop wrecking society, I would be pleased, you know? Well, well yeah. Um, I, I, I had an, a, a heavier burden and I might not have uh, in the debate in this sense uh, that, uh, that, that it was, uh, the, the, again, the resolution talks about a better way to persuade more people of libertarianism. Okay, and uh, so you you've spoken about uh, you know having a you know forming alliances of fellow travelers and all the rest, uh, and I had to talk about persuading people of libertarianism. So I had to play with that a little bit. And what I said at one point was, uh, look, if if, if if where is the threshold? If somebody wants to cut government, and again I said that. Government is the issue. At one point, Davis was trying to contradict me there. I said, if somebody wants to cut government by 80%, 90%, uh, isn't that good enough for you uh, to call them at least a small L libertarian? Uh, and, uh, you know, given, given the point that, that even Dan Davis kept con Davis contradicting himself, at one point he said, we can only persuade a few people. And then later said, we can, we can persuade a lot of people. I said, Dennis has not made up his mind as to whether we can persuade a few or a lot. But the fact is that uh, we want to persuade more people. Uh, and uh, and if we can get them over to the idea that government should be shrunken by 80%, 90%, and the Fed, a few of these other things, uh, then aren't they at least small L libertarians? And I, I'm I looking back on it, I regret not having said to the free state crowd because, by the way, I don't think they got a whole lot of out of towners there. Uh, I think that a lot of it, a lot of it was the locals were there because they didn't have celebrities to attract them. I should have said, "Question: Wouldn't you be overjoyed if if a thousand people arrived tomorrow morning who said uh, we're moving here to the free state because we want to shrink government by eighty to ninety percent of these?" Not aggression principle. Well, no, no, we don't care about. It. We just want to shrink government by eighty nine percent. I mean, in other words, I should have asked them uh, at what point are you going to start throwing your arms around uh, uh, people who move to the free state uh, who aren't necessarily uh, purists with respect to the non aggression principle? So I should have asked them that because because of course uh, you know here I am part of the chattering classes and yet dressing people like Dennis. And others up there who are trying to get something done. They try to start. They try to take over the state. They want to put Tom Woods in the governor's mansion. They'll never see that cast because Tom doesn't want to go to the government. But uh, they want to take over the state. So therefore, I should have I, I should have gotten more practical with them and said, I'm sure that if you will welcome these people to the free state, uh, who have been convinced that government should be considerably shrunk and no taxes in New Hampshire for that reason, and what a vote for you libertarians to take over the state politically, uh, that that's a good enough working definition of what a libertarian is. Uh, and that was that was a missed opportunity on my part. I'll clarify that. Because you, you know, you're talking about, you know, again, you know, we, we libertarians, of course, we've got our hat in our hand. We, we all he uh, look. I'm I'm grateful, and I, I've been making friends with Ben Burgess and some other left wingers recently on U.S. foreign policy, having to do with uh, with Israel and Middle East and so on. And uh, and uh, I I'm just uh, you know I, I I'm I'm just happy that uh, I mean there are a lot of the, as you know look as Tom you look you've, you've got perhaps historically the most ecumenical libertarian show. Uh, of, of all the podcasts, 
And, and I said, there's only one reason, because Tom, for most of his years, you had to, had to fill five five days of legal content. You have to be ecumenical. Exactly. Unless you want to have Epstein out all the time. I mean, that, that, that's a dumb idea. So, or, you know, the, hand, the handful, you can't you can't do that. that that's too suicidal. Tom isn't that dumb. You have, you have to have a reasonable sampling of guests. And, of course, now you're doing still three three uh, three a week. And and you uh, you know you don't do a, a a Bob Murphy you don't like to do a whole lot of lectures on your shows so you go, well what's my point now, my point is that you have had probably a, a large sample of, the, of fellow travelers on the show who uh, who who said useful things who come at it from a from a left wing perspective and when I'm when I'm, I, I I was having a discussion I'll reveal it because it was not really real secret I was having a, a discussion with Sheldon Richmond. Our mutual friend, uh, who's been on, he's been on your show, no doubt, right? Multiple she, times. Yep. She, as I say, Sheldon, I, Sheldon when, when you had you had me on to debate Israel with with a guy named Elliot Resnick, a a, a, a journalist, and uh, Sheldon was the one uh, who coached me, and I had to keep I had to tell Sheldon the other day that that when you were talking about the Palestinians, you've got to talk about property rights. That, that you don't want to get hung up on airy fairy self determination or whether they were state or not. Their property was taken from them. They mixed the labor with the soil, and their property was taken from them. Which Sheldon though, was going over with a certain amount of of actual upset and disgust that so many of the people who agree with us about the issue of uh, Israel's role in, in in Zionism generally are left wingers. And and Sheldon was <laughs> reminding me. And some of the most informed people are people who, uh, when it comes to economics, uh, that uh, you wouldn't agree with them. Why did I make that point? Uh, admittedly, uh, we have we have our fellow travelers with respect to foreign policy on the left, and we got to look for all the alliances we can find. However, those people are not likely to move to the free state of New Hampshire. Um, but 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 the, but people like Nina Teicholz might people. People for whom the dam breaks, people who see the two or three or four issues that they care about, uh, that they realize that government is at the root of the problem, that capitalism would help. Uh, and of course, I used the example that my primary targets are people, the left wing people. I should mention, as you've allowed me to say many times, uh, I came from intellectual depravity. And if I could rise from intellectual depravity in the way that I did, I. Uh, then there must be a chance for others. Mommy was a commie, literally a member of the Communist Party, and my father was an FDR liberal. And uh, so I had very little to learn from from my parents. You had you had intellectual advantages, Tom. Your dad was a libertarian, right? No, no, no. He was like a he was like a Reagan Repub like a blue collar Reagan Republican, which was still good enough to get me. It, it saved me from by default being a leftist, and and I definitely credit him for that. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, but yeah, come to think of it, yeah, that's right. I remember when you and you and Lou Rockwell were were talking about <laughs> talking, talking about the libertarians who came from the left, and libertarians who came from the conservative right, and you both agreed that both agreed that you prefer the libertarians to come from the conservative right, and uh, yeah, yeah, but but you know, but honestly, I, I mean. Uh, yeah, some some of them who come from the left kind of keep their left wing orientation, but there are others who shed it entirely. And so I have nothing against um, yeah. where they're coming from. Uh, let, let, let me say a little something though. I, I just have to uh, add a little detail that yeah. you're not aware of. Please, um, you came to my uh, murder mystery party in New yeah. York, and it was fun. A lot of and fun. so crazy time. Yeah, go ahead. I'm not, yeah, go ahead. And so since then, I've had one in Portland, Oregon. Yeah, and then. I'm having another one in Charleston, South Carolina, Boston, New Orleans, Dallas, Texas. Uh, these are an absolute blast. You have a wonderful yeah. time. You don't have to do any prep. You don't have to know any background. It, it, it's all explained to you th that night. We have a great time. Well, anyway, at the most recent one, Jenna puts together, my wife puts together a gift basket for the winner. And it's got all kinds of little goodies in there. But the capstone gift that we gave away at the last one and that we're going to give away the next few is an official Soho forum notebook with a likeness of Gene Epstein <laughs> saying 
learn some economics, which is, remember you mentioned that you lost your temper with Bhaskar Sankara? Yes. Learn some economics, Bhaskar. Yeah, no, well, there it is, an image of Gene Epstein saying, learn some economics on, an, no. on the cover of a notebook. Who wouldn't cherish that <laughs> gift? So if you haven't heard about my murder mystery parties, that's probably because you're not on my mailing list. Shame, shame. Uh, but go to woodsmystery.com and and uh, I want you to come come to one of these parties and you could win a notebook with Gene Epstein's likeness on it on that day that he lost his temper. <laughs> but, yeah, my, my, my assistant, Jane Met, Met, Jane Metton, who runs my organization, you know, she she abraded me for losing my temper. But she said, but but she said, uh, she insisted, because she's more clever than I, as and as are you, Tom, that that actually we can extract a little something great from that. So she's, she, she, you know, we, we're selling swag, T-shirts and such like that with me looking angry. She said, you know, that, that's, that's funny. That's comical. And that, and that doesn't reflect badly on you. You're the old guy who loves his channel, learn some economics. So that's not terrible for your image. That actually enhances your image. She assured me. So, uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to be assured that, uh, that you're, uh, you, you're not coming back to haunt me with that embarrassing time when I yelled at that guy. That no, 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 no. And you know, it's funny. Sometimes, um, well, well, it yeah. reminds me of the case with Ron Paul when he was on Morton Downey. Yeah. You can see the video of that. Yeah. And there's a, a guy at the, at the microphone asking him a hostile question. And Ron comes back with, uh, you know, well, you know, if you, if you want to govern what people put in their bodies, you know, with the drug war and stuff, then look, why doesn't the government... Uh, um, you know, tell you to get some exercise. You, you know, you, you're 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 a little overweight, and everybody thought, "Oh my gosh, Ron Paul was so badass." <laughs> but when you ask him about it, he's mortified about that appearance. I mean, he does not like that. Oh, oh, he, oh and he was. Forgive me. Uh, this person was a little overweight, wasn't? Oh, he was chubby. Yeah, he oh, was a big so dude. The kid was yeah. and so Ron, was feel, he feels bad about that. But 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 I I would comfort him and say, "Look, we we like seeing some you know." some energy, you know, yeah. from our yeah. folks. So, so nobody holds this against Eugene. And in fact, we, 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 we are so affectionate toward Gene Epstein that we actually want to, in some way, commemorate that moment. Well, so. I, mean, I guess that was the idea. Well, Tom, I am honored. I thank you for that. It, it, it is a worthy digression. Uh, and I guess that uh, was pretty much uh, my debate uh, with uh, Dennis. Uh, uh, he was a little miffed that that his vote slipped. And I said, look, Dar Dennis's is still the superior argument. And when we mentioned drugs, uh, uh, or uh, no, what was it that came out? Oh, no, 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 the vaccinations, right. So so somebody, oddly, Dennis was sort of losing it a little bit. Somebody asked him about vaccination. Well, how do you how do you respond to somebody who's against enforced vaccination? And uh, and that's when I conceded. I said, and I conceded that Certain arguments require uh, the, the non-aggression principle. That uh, that I said. Well, let's say let's say it's a it's, it's a hundred year co-op building, and uh, and the co-op decides that everybody's got to get vaccinated uh, with you know with the COVID vaccine, say, and and possibly come down with myocarditis if they're young. I said, oh, in that case, you you're stuck. You have to say that if you're going to force people. To put a foreign substance in their bodies, you bear a very heavy burden to prove, uh, and that that becomes relevant. And so, uh, so I, I just want to round out the argument by saying that uh, that certain uh, empirical questions uh, that are up for grabs, uh, it really is vital to bring in the framework. Uh, the framework being uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, that it that uh, people do own their own bodies and that uh, sometimes sometimes you can't leave home without it. So I, I did want to concede that point. It, I, it's essential at times. But again, uh, uh, there are lots of left-wingers who can become libertarian. And of course, uh, it's interesting uh, that I, I, uh, you know, Michael Rechtenwald, as you know, who was of course, came close, was supposed to be the guy who was going to become the presidential nominee from the Libertarian Party. Uh, he had a transformation from Karl Marx to Ludwig von Mises, and uh, it is. I, I'm 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 now realizing that no, I don't know if anybody's actually asked Michael for sort of a granular discussion of that. I, I'll I'll say something else, which 
is also peculiar that uh, that Thomas Sowell, uh, who again uh, Thomas Sowell is just the best, just the most embarrassing fellow traveler of all because he's written so many brilliant things on, on economics, and yet and yet he's a uh, interventionist hawk when it comes to U.S. foreign policy, uh, and happily has written very little about those issues. Uh, but uh, but I mention him only because. He wrote this rather odd book about Karl Marx. He claimed he started out as a Marxist. And, and, and I told Jason Riley, who wrote a, an intellectual biography of, of, Wood, of Thomas Sowell, that nobody's quite explained how he rose from that. I mean, I, I have explained uh, that I picked up uh, Man Economy and State and that, and then, and then Mises. And it became very important for me to understand what was always obscure in the standard textbooks, how workers climb on out of poverty under capitalism. That, that in fact, there was a passage in Mises in Human Action where the light bulb uh, went off in my head, finally, where I understood that and then uh, cited history. So I, I, can, I can recount my own odyssey in a fairly granular way, but, uh, but that's not true for everyone. I'll, I'll, my only point is that you can, I think that you can win over uh, those who care so much, well, believe that workers are getting exploited under capitalism, and that only through the intervention of the state, uh, creating some via labor unions, can worker wages rise. I don't think it's that difficult to explain it to people, uh, and you can win over some of them. Maybe we should segue in uh, because because I, I do segue into well. Actually, Gene, questions. let me let me intervene here. I th I think given the the time, oh, um, okay, sure. we, we might revisit the other one because the other oh, the other. Yes. Me, I was about to me, say, my, yeah, revisit the other one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, let me tease it a bit because okay. it was as we said at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. It was between you and David. David Friedman's also been a guest on the Tom Wood yeah, show. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. It was a debate on uh, more or less on the Austrian versus Chicago schools, yeah, yeah. but the with the resolution having to do with there being insights that the Austrians have, important insights that, that the Chicago people lack. Economic and solutions. Yeah, that, no, no. yeah. And that's an yeah. interesting topic for our people because, um, yeah. you know, I, to most of our opponents, let's say, they, in their opinion, you can't even slide a credit card between the two sides. They're so close together. So, oh. you know, we're nerds and we want to get to the bottom of what exactly does differentiate the two schools. And I would say uh, my opinion after having heard that debate, um, yeah. and I don't know if these debates will be in video form by the time this comes out. If so, oh. I'll put the link, All the right. links up, but I was able to get special copies because, you know, I host the Tom Woods show and I needed to be brief, but it, it's, it, it got into some fairly technical stuff that I think most, even most people who have read a lot of Austrian stuff sure. or, or let's say, yeah. The average person who's read some Austrian stuff would not be familiar with, like about uh, capital and labor and and natural yeah. resources and all that yeah. stuff, and even the stuff about uh, ordinal versus cardinal ranking of utility. Yeah. Uh, so it really, really went pretty deep, and I I feel like at this point we couldn't do it justice. So oh, okay, you want as well? Gosh, all right, Tom. Well, I, I look, I am a dictator here on the Tom yeah. Woods Show. This is. I don't let Gene Epstein come vote on the Tom. <laughs> Who would be the tiebreaker? It'd be Jenna. She's going to support me. What do you talk about? God, I, I, but I, I, do you want to take a minute to tell well, people about well, the next? I thought, look again. I, I thought. I, by by the way, I saw. I, I did indeed see about ten years ago, uh, Bob Murphy's exchange with David on a similar topic, and I didn't think. And uh, I have great respect for Bob, and learned a lot from. Him. Uh, I thought he was. I, I didn't think Bob. Uh, I, I thought David got the upper hand there, and in the, in that particular case. And by the way, uh, I I don't think that David is that far apart from uh, from Austrian economics. I thought he was being unfair to uh, Austrians. And at one point, I I read a passage from Mises. Mises just argued that that you can essentially create the edifice of of, of market economics and indirect exchange through a priori reasoning, but but Mises did stipulate there is economics and there is history. And Mises said that that you then have to empirically apply it to 
empirical reality to history. As I said, and history, of course, includes what happened this morning. And Mises said it could be irrelevant. There could be other things that you find uh, that that then make it inapplicable. And so uh, I only wanted to point out to David that he that he and and Mises are not that far apart. Uh, uh, I mentioned when I was talking to David something that he conveniently forgot that Milton Friedman published his unfortunate crazy paper of methodology about how uh, you don't have to explain human action at all. But David likes to explain human action. He likes to use hypotheses and apply them apply them to empirical reality. And so, by the way, uh, when you say there's not a whole lot of difference between uh, his Chicago School of Economics, he calls himself a Chicago School of Economics, and Austrian, and my version of Austrianism, he's right, there isn't a whole lot of difference. But but I think there are differences that matter, and I guess that's the reason why, I suppose, you're telling me that I got in, that I brought the discussion into, into technical issues that were lost on the audience. Maybe... Well, I don't know that they were lost on the audience, yeah. but... but no, I, but I, they might have been. Because- I, I mean, I, I will say, Tom, I, I was on, I was on Brentney Schaffer's show and I discussed this. She took to it a lot. I mean, of course, Brentney, I mentioned her, come to think of it, her father was a, was a, was a libertarian intellectual. So I suppose it was easy enough for her to explain. But I think it's, I think it's rather uh, stunning if you take any interest in economics to confront Murray Rothbard's point. And of course, it meant a lot to me when I picked up Man, Economy, and State, um, and got and, and that, which of course was my gateway drug to libertarianism and to Austrianism, where Rothbard came up with a stunning point that you read in the textbook that that the factors of production are land, land which is called, includes resources, the you know, resources, and and of course farmland, land, labor, and capital, and and all and and Rothbard said. No, there, there are only two original factors of production. There's only resources and there's labor. Capital comes from land and labor. Oh, all capital goods are, are imputable, derived from land and labor. And I thought uh, you were, uh, I mean, you were reacting as though that's a puzzling thing. I, I think that's kind of a fascinating, mind blowing insight worth making of the point. Yeah, if you slow it down, I'm talking to fact, and you explain to people the significance of that and why it matters. Yeah. Then yes, I didn't do that. Otherwise, you're throwing around lingo that does not land with people. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I promise it doesn't. Well, well, then that's how I screwed up. Fair enough. Uh, and I, maybe I didn't have enough time to to get into it. Um, I just said again that obviously uh, you when I said, for example, that of course obviously you were using you mean, you're probably using a hammer or you know uh, uh, Robinson Crusoe obviously had to use. Capital goods. I, it's very possible that within the seventeen and a half minutes I had, uh, what I wanted to do was target David's own microeconomics textbook and and David's own insights because he was my Chicago School economist, and I wanted to focus on that. Uh, and and I guess you're saying then that for me to, to try to explain that uh, that whatever capital goods you mentioned, be it a hammer. Be it a uh, a store, whatever uh, whatever it is, uh, it's obviously could only come from a natural resource uh, and from work and from labor, uh, and that and that, so therefore capital goods are secondary goods. I thought that was simple enough, and it's and, simple, but okay, okay, but but most, it's kind of most people kind of vacuous. Hang on, Gene. It's the Tom Woods show, so hang on. Okay. Um, it, most people are not familiar with with the whole that this is even a controversy. Oh, then you introduce it to them, yeah. and they say, "Well, that seems to make sense." If if I'm following what Gene is saying, I see what he means. But then the issue is, it would have to be emphasized multiple times why that makes a difference. Well, or there, there what a, exactly is David Friedman's objection to that, and why is it? Well, he, he, what is consequential about, if I may use that word, about his difference of opinion with you on this? Well, because. It's an impo- It's never. Uh, my point is that, uh, ironically, I'm saying that 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 Rothbard had a sort of a pure understanding of how, why the capitalist makes any money at all. In other words, that that that, that the capitalist is, is is not originating. The capitalist is only uh, 
putting out the resources so that things can be created from land and labor. He he still and then in fact, I, I as you recall, I used the story from Baum Bauer about about how it will take five years to produce a factory and that and that the first worker works in the uh, works in the first year, the second worker works in the second year, the third, fourth, and fifth years, and that uh, and that it takes time to create capital because oh well, I'm going over these issues and you're saying that I'm going over them too fast and that probably I lost my audience by going over them too briefly in my discussion. No, I think both of you lost the audience. Okay. If, I, if you were, if you really want my frank appraisal, <laughs> I think both of you are talking yeah. about things that we're no one's defining terms. No one's, because um, I'll say, Gene, this is one thing I'm actually good at. Oh, okay. okay one thing I'm good at well, is look, you're, you're, I you're, never you're, assume, you're I never assume people know all the lingo or yeah. when the Fed buys treasuries, you've already lost 85% of America when you yes, talk like that. I know what I could have done. Well, well, look, Tom, I, 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 uh, I, I think I'm just, By the way, I'm not angry. Like you're making this confrontational when it's not. What? I'm just telling you that um, if you're going to talk about what that is a high level concept. I'm not making a conference. Ninety nine percent of Americans have never even heard this discussed before. Well, that's no, indeed, Tom. Look, I look again. You know, I, I, uh, I mean, I, I, uh, I made a mistake. Screwed up. That's fine. And you're saying we both lost our audience. But let me mention one other issue that came up with somebody. Who, 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 it, this was this issue where uh, uh, he goes after Rothbard on the issue of. Of uh, of the of that of the declining marginal utility of the goods you consume, and and it, this point scoring has to do with the idea that if a cake takes four eggs, then or if a, or if a car takes four wheels, four wheels, then <laughs> then you 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 actually value the fourth unit more than the third unit yeah. is, was the argument. Right, right. But so, then the answer to that, so so the idea of, see, here's, here's what I well, mean. Yes. The idea of, of diminishing marginal utility is that as I acquire more units of a particular good, then I, I, there is less utility coming to me with each subsequent good simply because I apply each subsequent good to a less urgent need. So if I have water, the first unit I apply to drinking. That's the right. second unit I apply to bathing. The third unit I apply to washing my car. So if I lose a unit, I'm not going to not drink. I'm not going to. It's instead I just won't wash my car. And That's and so right. yes. so each additional thing that I acquire, each unit of that good, because it's placed to a to a less urgent need, it yields me less utility. But the argument being made here is that well, here we have the opposite case because. The third wheel on a car doesn't do you much good till you have the fourth wheel. So in that case, the the fourth unit is yielding you more utility than the third unit. But the answer to that would simply be in a case like that, where the the car is not operational without the four wheels, then the unit is four wheels. The unit in question is four wheels. Well, that's why. Well, well, yeah. Well, Tom, you know, ironically, it made me feel a bit. I was a little surprised that the boat went against me. I, I thought I was dealing with substance and that, and that David was spending a lot of time citing his triumphs for publishing this book or that book, whatever. But no, I, and again, I hope you realize I'm trying, I'm not being kind of confrontational or defensive. I'm taking your, your critique personally. Uh, I'm, I'm, excuse me, I'm not taking it personally. I'm taking it seriously. And, uh, and it's really fine. Uh, what you're saying, I guess uh, it was probably a misconceived uh, thing. To, to I thought that I uh, that I, I, I had oddly I allot ninety minutes to a debate because I only, I only get half the time and that and I only speak for seventeen and a half minutes. So you're saying it was probably an hour long seminar that had to be taught. So maybe there just wasn't enough time to get into. Yeah, or if or it was a debate to be had in a graduate school seminar or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, 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 but by the way, Tom. Uh, I don't think the way I, I latched upon the four wheel thing or the four egg story because uh, there I thought I was quoting Rothbard very concretely, and there I think you didn't quote Rothbard. In other words, the the the, the point that Rothbard makes, which I believe is is that all of these the the the, the idea that that we that we're defining a good in terms of physical uh, 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 count, uh, nose counts is not the point. I, I usually, I responded by saying, let's say that 
that that that that that, that uh, they they develop chickens who can bring out huge eggs, large enough so that the cake just takes one egg and doesn't require four eggs. That's all arbitrary. Uh, let's say we bring out a car that can actually run on one wheel. Uh, the point that Rothbard makes is that all of what you use is defined subjectively. That 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 a one wheel car is just not a car. Uh, that 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 is defined in subjective terms, and therefore the four eggs are the unit. That, that, and then I said, and that's the crucial divide. I said between me and David, that, that he tends to look at the objective world far too much, whereas the Austrians, and Rothbard in particular, because he grappled with that issue specifically in Men Economy, say, define all goods in subjective terms. And and, right. so, and so you began, it's, it's easy enough, of course, to start with a glass of water, but indeed, uh, that's where Rothbard said, four eggs are the unit. Uh, and, yeah. and, uh, and, that, and that you're getting hung up on the physical world uh, rather than understanding that everything all uh, that all consumption is subjective. So I thought I thought I made that point. But anyway, um, we should kiss this off, uh, I guess. I mean, the and because because I was about to say that it was, <laughs> of course that there here I really lose your audience where I I I, uh, I spoke with uh, one of the guys who attended the debate and he said he voted for me. But and and. And we discussed indifference cuts. The thing that real that I think is almost the biggest joke in the world is that is that whenever you open up the the, the uh, a, a mainstream textbook or indeed in in in, uh, in David's intermediate textbook, they're talking about consumer spending, and then they want to talk about indifference. And what is an indifference cover? Indifference cover is that that you, that you're indifferent to, to two units of good A and th- and three units of this, or you just that. That that there's a, a a level in which you're indifferent, or that when you go to a store and you buy and you and you see boxes of strawberries and you see 19 different boxes, you're indifferent. They all look the same. They're all pretty standard. So you just choose one of them. You're indifferent to which one you pick up. It it's not like you, you when you tell them, "Could I have a box of strawberries?" and the and the and the salesperson doesn't say, "Which one do you want?" Well, they're all, they're all fresh. They all look the same. Uh, so just any box. So we're and, and Rothbard said, "How crazy is it to, to, to think that what we're indifferent to as is, is central to human action?" I'm getting hung up on it. All I'm saying is that I think it's uh, I mentioned that because 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 David and others argue that somehow or other, starting with what you're indifferent to, and then and then pricing it and all the rest of it is somehow or other germane to the issue. And, I, and it, to my mind, it's the perfect example of violating. Occam's razor that 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 you that when you're talking about as I I thought I was emphasizing but obviously not very well uh, 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 the idea as Rothbard said that that consumers are never inconsistent they're just not constant uh, things are changing all the time Con- consumer spending is a dis- con- the actions of the consumer are always a discovery often a discovery procedure you have different amounts of money they're in new goods. That, 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 that that's what you talk about rather than drawing indifference curves here because because what consumers are indifferent to is the last thing of interest. What consumers choose of one over the other in any particular moment, that's what matters. Why do I mention that? Only because I, I think that that in a way, uh, the, 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 the thing that is so laughable about uh, Mainstream economics, when it comes to the consumer, the, the example that's the most laughable at all of all is the obsession with what is known as indifference. That indifference is, is central to to, uh, to their examination of consumer spending, uh, whereas it so obviously violates Occam's razor. It's so obviously extraneous, as Rothbard said, to the decisions we make and the choices we make as consumers. But uh, that too, I guess, is kind of boring because it's just very textbooky, and uh, so that's the reason why that wasn't a very interesting debate. Uh, and I appreciate well, you, Gene. I I don't know. I like you're you're taking this really personally, and I oh, well, I, I don't mean it in that word in any way. Well, I'm just not not in not in any way. All I'm telling you <laughs> is that we, yeah. you and I, because yeah. we read a lot of books yeah, yeah. and and we're in this universe, yeah. take for granted what. What we think is quote obvious to everybody. Well, well, no, when you're introducing, con- hang on a minute. You're, when you're introducing concepts that 
Yeah. The vast bulk of people, like I would say, I bet a lot of people listening to this had real trouble following what was going on. Yeah, just now. Yeah. It's, it, it's introduced so fast yeah. and, and, and they can barely keep up. It, it has to be broken down more slowly. Well, and if that means that in the debate, you cover two instead of four objections to the Chicago school, that's vastly better because well, it will resonate. Yeah. People will walk away saying, I remember those two problems with the Chicago school instead of, well, my understanding is there are a lot of problems with the Chicago school, but I don't remember or understand any of them. That's, exactly. that's the concern. I hope, Just from a debater's standpoint. Tom, I wholeheartedly endorse that principle. I even like to think that I've lived by it, as a, but absolutely. And uh, indeed, I guess... I, I I guess I got myself cornered. Uh, I by, oh, 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 by the way, I I do. I should emphasize a couple of things. Number one, as you said, that that was probably given given that uh, I do think that 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 the only key issue is that David thinks that we Austrians are not empirical, and uh, and and, uh, and 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 Mises and Rothbard are very empirical. They, they they, they 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 have an edifice of principles. However, they 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 do have to apply it to the data, to the real world, and they recognize that. That was the only big mistake on David's part. But because David believes, as a Chicago school economist, and by and large, I I said that 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 Friedman, for the most part, satisfied. Uh, the rules of, of of the Austrian economics start with the principle of the human action. Talk about the, how people act, and then apply it to the empirical data. So, therefore, by the way, I don't. I you and I might disagree. I sh I think that there are certain key uh, things that this, that David does as a Chicago School economist: indifference curves, the belief in uh, in cardinal utility, uh, the a, 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 a sort of a hazy understanding, hazy role, understanding of the role of the capitalist and the entrepreneur. Those the, the, those things, those issues become very clear and come into bold relief when you're an Austrian. And I think those are the only real inadequacies in David's treatment of the of economics. And uh, and as you say, they probably belonged in a graduate seminar to discuss rather than uh, in a general uh, uh, discussion, yeah. But you know what, Gene? I think, uh, to be honest, given the state of economics instruction these days, yeah. the graduate seminar might have been even more uncomprehending because <laughs> they don't talk about these foundational things at all. Like well, uh, yeah. capital could be broken down into labor and, and land and all. I, I don't know if these foundational issues are even covered. Certainly the history of thought that you guys were talking about yeah. is absolutely either on its way out or gone from yeah. the economics department. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, it, it gets back to uh, the, the other thing that went on, which is that, um, again, uh, it was fairly clear that uh, that uh, that the people at Porkfest wanted another uh, debate between me and David, and uh, that uh, they, they they weren't getting Tom Woods to come last year. They got RFK Jr. to come. They got today Ramaswamy. They were really bereft. Of the big names, Tom, and all they had was me and David. So I worked hard to think in terms of another kind of debate that David and I could have. And uh, did David, by the way, has written me now that, that he wants to have a, a more broad, broader debate about his critique of Rothbard. And I, I told him that we can't cover that in ninety minutes. I mean, it's uh, you know this and that, that that would be you know I. That would be a discussion that would go on for several hours because pretty much what you said, you have to basically begin from square one and begin to, to discuss uh, the basic issues first and then lay the groundwork and then talk about how the, how the differences apply. So in right, because, because, for example, let's say you were doing a class on welfare economics. Yeah. And when we talk about welfare econ economics, we're not talking about welfare payments. Mm -hmm. We're talking about uh, actions that, that, that uh, make people better off, that improve their welfare. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you were to talk about Rothbardian welfare economics, there's a there's a lot to talk about. I mean, he has a classic essay on it. There have been commentaries on it. So if you were to teach a class on it, you would take a whole class time to teach that. So if you also have to debate Rothbard per se, and even just talking about his welfare economics, even mm -hmm. explaining the concepts would be a whole class from time. It's tricky to do. So you would really have to nail down exactly what you want to talk about. Otherwise. 
he's going to make uh, 58 objections and and you have to run around answering them when the groundwork hasn't even been laid. Well, you know, if you actually, uh, if you, uh, ironically, I went in one direction, having looked at the, uh, the uh, actually held at Porkfest was an exchange, not a formal cell phone debate, basically a debate between Bob Murphy and David Friedman. And, and they were just, they went, they went over a whole range of issues of this one, that one. And I, and my reaction was more or less your reaction uh, to what, to my debate that, that, they, that they were touching on way too much uh, at, uh, in, in a relatively brief time for anybody to follow it. So I actually thought, well, I'll just focus on specific things that David is. And yet, as you say, I started talking about capital and labor and the rest of it. And uh, I, there's just not enough time to lay the groundwork, or at least I failed to do so. So, uh, well, in fact, in fact, I'll, I'll give a Soho form example, then we'll wrap up. Okay. Uh, Bob Murphy debated, uh, I think it was George Selgin. On, on Fractional on, Reserve Banking. Yeah. On Fractional Reserve Banking. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think one of the reasons Bob didn't win yeah. is that he started off, he had 15, they each had 15 minutes for opening statements. Yeah. Bob took almost 10 minutes of his opening statement to explain the terminology to everybody. Yeah. So that put him at an automatic disadvantage. Since that it was necessary for that terminology to be explained, he should have asked you. Listen, um, if da- if if George and I can agree on a mutual definition of these of these terms, then let me lay out these definitions and have it not count against anybody's time. So, so it, it hurt Bob, I think. Yeah, they, yeah. Now, indeed, uh, well, well, you 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 do, you do raise you do raise a problem. Ironically, uh, I allocate as much as 90 minutes to a debate. For example, my now, of course, give me an opportunity to to, uh, to, to do some promotion of the cell phone. In uh, July 15th, uh, uh, in New York City, at uh, the Sheen Center on Bleecker Street, with a party, I'm having Matt Ridley. And uh, and as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm uh, benefiting from Freedom Fest because Matt is coming to, going to Freedom Fest. Matt Ridley, the best-selling author, some of your unscience issues, very engaging guy and a very engaging writer. And he will be uh, defending the idea that SARS-CoV-2 originates from the Wuhan lab. And I had a hell of a heck of a difficult time getting an opponent for him and uh, finally did, a virologist. So he's going to be punching above his weight. But in any case, I am definitely allocating 90 minutes to that. But what I'm, by ironically, I mean that I have been criticized that I that I, I allocate I give the debaters so much time. There were debates where they each get like six minutes to make their case, and uh, and uh, I and yet seventeen and a half minutes sometimes just isn't enough time to get into the issues. Uh, I am at the maximum amount of time I can I can devote to any debate is ninety minutes, and I will give Matt seventeen and a half minutes to to, to lay out his case. Seventy and a half minutes to the other side, seven and a half for rebuttals, and I'm hoping that uh, that Matt has the ability. I, I know he, he's a very accomplished popularizer to lay out the argument, and I'm um, hoping that the issue will not, you know, get in, get into so many scientific technicalities that the audience is lost. It's it. I, I'm uh, by the way that that is doing very well at the ticket box. Because there's been so much in the news lately, the issue of whether uh, COVID originated in the Wuhan lab, uh, and I hope the audience isn't disappointed. But I'm allocating the maximum amount of time that anybody normally, but way more than most debate uh, debates do allocate, seven and a half a piece to each of them. Uh, and uh, in August and September, I'm having somewhat lighter fare. Uh, in August 14th, I'm having Art Laffer. Defend Trump as the candidate. Laffer, Laffer is coming to tell us also that we should vote for Trump. And I had originally decided that the opponent would be the the, the the LP, the Libertarian Party presidential candidate. And so that will be Chase Oliver. Which originally oh, it would be it would be Michael Reginald. And then in September, I'm having uh, David Stockman, who of course has been on your show a number of times. As you know, David is a huge advocate of RFK Jr. And so David will be 
uh, arguing the Libertarian Institute Old Book for RK Jr. And there I'm going to have a Mike Termat, who ended up being the vice presidential candidate. In that case, I'm going to actually shorten it because people tell me 90 minutes is a lot of time uh, for a debate. Uh, in uh, the August and September debates, I'm going to allocate 80 minutes, so 15 minutes apiece, to make your basic case for each of the candidates, and then no rebuttal time. So those are my next three debates, and uh, I hope I hope uh, yeah, um, everybody can come. I'm sure, Tom, you've got all kinds of promises to keep. I know you're going out to Freedom Fest yourself, Las Vegas, and uh, and uh, well, but I'm I'm lucky that that Matt uh, Ridley. Uh, has a reason to come to the U.S. and is going to uh, leave Freedom Press and come to New York on, uh, that night. And uh, again, I'm looking forward to having dinner with him. As you know, you, you've had Matt on the show a couple of times. I imagine Matt Ridley. Yes. Well, I'm quite a, a fan of Matt Ridley, and I, I was great to have a chance to visit him over in England. Uh, oh, that's right. Last yeah. year. Well, you'll, well, you'll see him out. You'll, you'll see him out in Vegas. He's going to be. There. Yeah, but I'll, I'll I'll have an opportunity to see him in Vegas. But I. He, you know, being the Viscount Ridley and and yep. and uh, holding that position for in his family for hundreds of years, he has rather uh, an impressive estate. So it was nice to have a chance to to have a look at it. But anyway, thusforum dot org is the website. He's, everybody. he's he's donating. By the way, I'm I'm paying him a fairly handsome fee. He's donating a little money. Uh, it, we, we, yeah, no, no, it, no. It, and Matt, well, I just want to as well. Matt, of course, is coming to the after party, and. I, the, the the one thing about Matt is he he just wants to be friends with everybody. He'd say he's he's the sweet most outgoing guy. I guess he wants wants to make it clear that he might be from the House of Lords, but he's just just a guy who loves to hang out with people. So he's a great guy. Terence Keeley is similar, by the way. Terence Keeley, whom of course you had on the show, uh, 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 and uh, is also a Brit, and they're friends. And they're very similar personalities. Two, two British guys who just love to spend time with people. And so I'm taking Matt out to dinner the night before. Looking forward to that. So do come and you got it. Soulform.org. The Soulform.org. Yeah. Uh, where tickets are available to all three of these events. And I think you ought to act fast because, interestingly, even though I'm a little apprehensive about whether Matt will be able, uh, whether argue with a virologist whether it would be able to simplify the argument about why he believed it likely came from the one lab. Uh, uh, I'm apprehensive about whether uh, it could be done in seven and a half minutes. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's turned out to be a very popular event. People are, uh, are indeed interested. Obviously, Matt is a draw to begin with, but I think also the topic has been in the news a lot. So that's why uh, ticket sales are pretty brisk on that one. So I urge you to buy your tickets if you can come. Uh, especially for that one, because we could be sold out. Yes. All right. Very good. Okay. Thanks so much, Gene. As always, great talking to you. And I hope the master bedroom ends up in good shape, Tom. Uh, it's going to be ready, ready. And when when is it? When is the work going to be completed? The master bedroom. Your master bedroom, Tom. Oh, uh, within two days. <laughs> okay, that's good. Yeah. The, the, the world did not need to know about that, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Gene. Okay. I'm and thank you. You got that point I'm out. Trying to say goodbye. Will you let yeah. me say goodbye already? We've been on for about five hours. <laughs> Nobody's listening anymore. Oh, okay. Yeah. Goodbye, John. All right. Bye, Gene, and goodbye, ladies and gentlemen. Make yourself and those you love less vulnerable to the regime, both mentally and physically. Get more forbidden information at Tom'sFreeBooks.com and be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you listen. See you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.